So, there being a quorum present, uh, center parent is out sick today. Um, let's get started, because we have plenty of work to do this morning. So I wanted to welcome to the committee, uh, Messrs. Chapman, Schwer, and Redmond. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming in. Um, and I, uh, you were saying you, well, the three of you, you're just gonna, we don't need to do it in sequence, however you wanna use the time. You know the agenda we wanna go through. There's a lot of PFAS work we wanna check in on. Right, and yeah, so there's a, there's a lot we're going to try and uh, inform the committee of in a relatively short period of time. We sort of switch back and forth, so we thought it'd be better since we're setting sort of together here anyway to just yeah. talk to you from here. So, for the record, Matt Chapman, General Counsel from the Agency of Natural Resources. So, I'm just going to give sort of a brief overview of what you told us we need to do, uh, needed to do last year, and sort of of where we're at. So, um, last year you passed Act 21, which basically did a number of significant things. It uh, required sampling of, uh, it both sat, set an interim standard for five PFAS compounds at 20 parts per trillion. It uh, required sampling of all public community water systems and non-transient non-community water systems, which are basically your traditional, what you think of as a, a water system, but also schools, condominium associations, places where, where people stay and drink the same water for extended periods of time. And that total population is how uh, in terms of number of systems, yeah. uh, approximately uh, 590 systems. Thank you. So then you also require that the agency adopt an MCL for the five PFAS compounds, uh, develop a plan to, uh, uh, for how we might regulate water quality standards with respect to PFAS, and then develop a, a, an inspector, a, a, a statewide monitoring plan for PFAS in the environment. Um, so just sort of next slide, Jim. Um, so just to give you a, this is sort of an overview of what we did with respect to the, the sampling plan. So we were focused on uh, sampling in uh, public community water or public water supply systems. We did a limited amount of surface water sampling. Uh, we tested uh, landfill leachate at all of the line landfills in the state. We did a significant uh, cross-section of wastewater treatment facilities looking at both the influent and the effluent of those systems. And then we looked at uh, electroplating and car washes as two uh, sort of high priority industrial activities. So next up. Can I ask, what's an electroplating? Where like the chrome finishes on I, metal. On vehicles. Right, okay. vehicles and okay. other okay. Thank you. type of products. On wastewater treatment facilities, that was influent, effluent, and did you do sludge as well? We did. We also looked at sludge. So we'll, and we'll get into more detail on what the results were with each of those. Okay. Uh, for the record, uh, Brian Redman. I'm the director for the Drinking Water and Groundwater Protection Division in DEC. Uh, I'm going to cover briefly the uh, results of the uh, monitoring at the public water systems as required uh, under Act 21. Uh, this first pie chart is showing uh, the results at the water systems themselves. Uh, as I just stated earlier, there's approximately 590 uh, water systems that have tested under Act 21. Uh, in addition to that, we've required testing of out-of-state bottled water that's approved to, for sale in Vermont. Uh, and that, that testing is, is ongoing. We've established a slightly um, later deadline uh, for the receipt of those samples. Oh, uh, June, if you could just go back real quick. Uh, what this pie chart is, is saying is uh, 505 uh, water systems that uh, sampled were, the results were non-detect. Uh, so overall, um, we, were, we were pleased that our caseload um, was, was not as significant as it could be. Um, with that said, the next piece of pie there, the 85, are the number of water systems where we saw detections of uh, one of the 18 PFAS compounds uh, under the Act. The Act directed us to sample um, for uh, the maximum number of PFAS compounds possible. Uh, th that's more than the regulated five in Vermont. There's a total of 18 compounds that are um, analyzed under EPA method 537.1. So that 85 represents 85 water systems where we found it at least a detection of one of the 18 compounds analyzed under the method. Uh, the 55 represents the number of detections that we saw 
uh, under EPA 537.1 of the regulated five compounds. We had 55 water systems in the state um, that had a detection of one of the five regulated compounds. Uh, the smallest slice of five is uh, the number of uh, samples that a number of water systems where results are pending. Uh, we had very high rates of compliance with the monitoring uh, required under the Act. Uh, we believe two of those five, uh, the, the lab results are still pending, um, and we're working with the other three water systems to gain compliance with the requirements. So just a tremendous um, uh, rate of compliance, uh, more than we typically see. What's the low threshold for non-detect? Uh, the minimum reporting level is two nanograms per liter, or two parts per trillion. Uh, the four are the impacted public drinking water systems. You can go to the next slide, June. Uh, we had four systems that exceeded uh, the interim 20 parts per trillion standard and are placed on the do not drink notice. Those are the Mount Holly School, the Thetford Academy, the Killington Mountain School, and the Fiddlehead Condominiums. Uh, those, uh, each of those four water systems have followed the mandate of issuing the do not drink and have provided their users with bottled water in the interim emergency response. Each of the four entities have engaged the services of a consulting engineer and are currently working on uh, both short and long term solutions for their water supply. Uh, we're still waiting for the engineering analysis in most of the cases. In general, the agency's preferred alternative where feasible is finding a source of clean water. That could be drilling a new water supply source, that could be improving the existing well or connecting on to a, a different well that is tested and clean. Where's kids in the country? Uh, we don't need all kids in the country. No. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, that is a daycare in Dover. Okay. Uh, the reason for the asterisk there is their initial result was exceeded the 20 parts per trillion. Uh, the act requires confirmation of that. The okay. mean of those two samples dropped below the 20 parts per trillion. Uh, so we have required that they issue public notice letting their users know um, of the situation and they're on increased monitoring. Are you in a position yet to see what's going on in these places or you're still doing re the engineering research? So I mean, I think if what you're looking at is for the, sort of what is the source of PFAS. I think it's fair to say that there's no obvious source that we've looked and the investigations are ongoing. Another item uh, in, in the realm of public drinking water under the Act is establishing uh, a maximum contaminant level for PFAS. Uh, the agency has filed a proposed final rule with LCAR. I believe it's on the agenda for the committee on February 20th. Uh, the, the revised rule uh, sets the maximum contaminant level at the, at the same as the interim standard in the Vermont Health Advisory of 20 parts per trillion for the regulated five compounds, establishes a maximum contaminant level goal of zero. Uh, we within the rule, we required EPA method 537 or an alternate as approved by the secretary. There already is new EPA methods um, that, have, that have been released since the, the time we filed the rule. Uh, one of the big <coughs> items is the ongoing monitoring framework for public drinking water systems. So the rule establishes an ongoing monitoring um, requirement for public water supplies uh, for testing for PFAS out into the future. Uh, it establishes technical standards for treatment, our standards for treatment, um, specifically granular, granular activated carbon, uh, really wasn't where they need to be. So we have, um, especially for treating a compound of this, of this nature, so we've made some uh, modifications to our technical standards. And finally, it provides the health effects language that we've developed in close concert with the Vermont Department of Health, uh, including the do not drink uh, language. Okay, I'm taking over now for the record. I'm Chuck Schwer. I'm the director of our Waste Management Prevention Division. And um, I'm going to focus on the testing we've done in the waste streams as well as the wastewater treatment plants, which are part of that. Uh, I'm giving you right off the bat uh, what you're going to find with the uh, slides going forward. And there's a lot of technical information. I'll try to go through it quick, but clearly if you have any questions, let me know. But the big takeaway is that we detected PFAS in nearly all waste sampled. 
And I think it was a little surprising to me, but what we found was the largest loading into landfill was residential source materials, which I'll go into that. So things we throw out every day um, are contributing to the, to the PFAS in the leachate. And just initially, our, our belief is that to solve that part of the problem, there's really no easy solution, and, and we can talk about that. Uh, my next big quick question. So do you go to different transfer stations around the state to do the sampling or just go right? So this was work that Casella did and they not only uh, did waste that was coming in, but they did do um, some targeted sampling at uh, different sources. Uh, in regard to what we found, ooh, please back one. Uh, yeah, I think, where did we go? Yes, thank you. Um, for the wastewater treatment plants, we did find uh, PFAS coming in the influent at nearly all wastewater treatment facilities that we tested, including ones that accepted landfill leachate and industrial, as well as ones that didn't. And not surprising, we did find that the highest concentration of influent were at wastewater treatment facilities that accept landfill leachate. Not a surprise. Uh, as part of uh, the permit that we issued, News Vermont or Casella to expand Coventry, we did require them to look at two on-site treatment and two off-site treatment uh, methods for landfill leachate. The good news was there are technologies out there that can treat it. The bad news is very, very expensive and it didn't necessarily deal with the entire problem. There were unanswered questions with residuals. What do we do when we, if we concentrate all this PFAS out of the leachate, where do we take it? What's the best way to treat it? So there's still some science that needs to catch up with this, but uh, at least initially there is some good, good news that it can be done. It's just whether we as a state want to spend that kind of money. Sure. Are there, I mean, I'm guessing this is a worldwide challenge or at least countrywide, right? So are there, are, are there other jurisdictions that are ahead of us technically and we can see not the that, answers? Not that we found, but we're still looking at that. And I'll, I'll get into that report a little bit farther down and we can talk about that. So moving on to the next one, just real quickly, we, to, to reach these conclusions, we relied on reports that News Vermont did, which I mentioned they tested the um, different materials coming into the landfill. The state uh, sponsored an evaluation of landfill leachate, wastewater treatment plant, influent effluent, biosolids, and sludge. We hired a company called Weston and Sampson. And then lastly, Casella hired Brown and Caldwell to do the evaluation of the treatment uh, uh, methods that I just talked about. So we'll quickly review that as we move forward. So now to get into a number of uh, bar charts where we'll take a look at the findings of what came into the landfill. Uh, the, and, and what's really important to note when you're looking at these is the right, the left hand column of concentrations. So by far, this is in nanograms per gram or parts per trillion and the two, well no, it's in part per trillion, but if you look at the um, top 2,000, that would be two parts per billion. I'm not sure if I follow. So just in terms of scale, if we think about our health standard as uh, for drinking water right. as 20 parts per trillion, right. the far right column is reaching two parts per billion or a, a thousand times more than a part per trillion. So we're seeing, the, the real takeaway is we're seeing very high concentration of PFAS containing products in bulky waste and textiles like furniture, mattresses, clothing, things like that that Casella tested had very high concentrations. If we go to the next one, uh, this was what they did. We don't, uh, in, in order to protect their clients, Casella did not give us the names of the particular companies that they sampled, but they did sample municipal sludge and industrial sludges that they accepted the landfill. So again, looking at the uh, scale on the left, we're up to 300, 250 per per trillion. So 
you know, almost an order of magnitude less than what the bulky material showed. But the takeaway is we were seeing PFAS compounds in those materials as well. We go to the next one. This is just a continuation of the sludges and industrial uh, and municipal sampling that Casella did. So if we move on to the next category, we looked at construction and demolition debris, including carpeting. We know that a lot of carpeting has the stain resistant treatments on it. Um, scotch guard stuff like that? Yes, exactly. See the rest of the scotch guard? Yeah, so we have. Definitely. Probably a scotch very scotch guard is Yeah. Concentrated? Mm -hmm. Reconstituted with water. Everybody that mm -hmm. sprays it on their coat in their yeah. kitchen. Yeah. Yes. Right. So again, the big bars represent uh, detections mm -hmm. in that waste. And here we're up, the highest bar is up to one part per billion or a thousand parts per trillion. So again, pretty high concentrations of waste that we bring to the landfill on a regular basis. The red bar is what, which material? PFOS, and that is the predominant material in the Scotch Guard. Is the, the things you throw in your dryer in there? To, Softeners. Softeners. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, boy, I tell you, we're finding in almost everything, so I wouldn't be surprised if we do, but I don't know that to be the case. Yeah, that's a good question. Chuck, before you go on, man, quick question. Earlier on, you were talking about the communities, the country kids, Craftsbury Fire District. Have they all been notified? Has everybody been? Yes. Every, all the users. users. All the yes. users. Yeah. The user. The requirement is for distribution of notice to the users on the water systems themselves. Okay. And, and then, so those folks are in contact with the health department for monitoring and all those kinds of things. Correct. And my team is uh, back to Senator Bray's question about figuring out the source. Our team is really working hard to do that. And I know you know Richard, who's yes, spent right. a bunch of time, and he's yeah. been to two or three public meetings in Mount Holly. Okay. They were doing some extensive sampling there this week to try to figure out the source. Okay. There is a nearby fire department, which could be a source, but at this point it's way too early to say that's, that's the, the source country, or not. Kid, Kids Country or whatever it was in the Crafts Ferry Fire District, that's all still between 15 and 15. They, have still, they all know. Crafts Ferry, Crafts Ferry was dead on 20 parts per okay. trillion, so um, they're now collecting um, a, a next sample for okay. the net. We put them on quarterly monitoring. Okay. And so the results of that sample will find the mean between those and that will determine if they're, if they're on a state mandated <laughs> contract or not. Okay. The, the, the people have been aware, so they yes. can go to their no. doctor and be tested. Yes, and public notice okay. is, a, is a feature. Yes. <laughs> next one. So this is, a, <laughs> there's a lot of different um, waste that were sampled here, water proof coating, surface coating, cosmetics, food packaging, the list goes on. But again, the takeaway is at varying concentrations, pretty much almost everything except for those few to the far right, we had some level of detection with the wire manufacturing being the, the highest concentration, which we've known about. We've looked at wire coating. That was the, the site in Pownall. Right. Uh, and we've looked at a few other wire coating locations in Vermont. Like the wire or, or cable? Uh, yeah, cable. Yeah, it would be the coating for either. But again, if we go back to reminding ourselves of the scale, even though we detected it, this is 80 to 100, so it's in the the, the slightly lower category versus the textiles and bulky waste. We can go to the next one, Jude. So one question before you move on, it said coated paper. So tons of people pick paper disposable products because they think they're better. Is that still the standard coating on all like paper plates, paper cups, all that sort of stuff? Or are there companies that are switching over to other I'm, I'm guessing that it depends on the company. There are certainly some companies that are trying to make sure they stay away from people. So there are alternatives at this point. 
came out of your glossy. I think, I, think I, think it's, yeah. I think it's fair to say that we can't yeah. say with the level of pre like precision mm -hmm. whether consumer products have done away with PFAS or have moved to a different PFAS that's sort of like outside the bandwidth of what we normally test for. Great. Um, right. No, yeah. I, I, I think that's, I think that's yeah, the that's challenge point. that we have. Just right another now. chemical that we haven't found yet. Right. Correct. The, the shorter chain PFAS that they were saying is better because it doesn't accumulate in the body as long, but I don't okay. think the science yeah. is out there to say it's really safer. But. Right, right. Okay. So that's sort of undetermined at this point. I think we just, we don't have enough information to really say. They have a, prove your name out there, Gen X. Gen X. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this next slide is kind of an interesting one. What we tried to do with this is not uh, look entirely at concentration, but look at the mass. So we know what the concentration is, then how much volume is being. Uh, brought into a landfill and we've had some waste composition studies over the year that uh, my team has been involved with. So using that data, we tried to look at what is really the biggest mass loading into the landfill and it's textiles, bulky waste, and carpeting were really the three big ones. And then if you look way to the left, the municipal and industrial sludges clearly are still uh, significant contributors. but a fair amount less than the other three. Sorry, what do you get? What is bulky is means what? What's that? Like mattresses, carpets, yeah. clothes, carpets. Furn carpets. furniture, uh -huh. carpet separated out. Yeah, and carpet is separated to the right. And this is uh, that, that clothing. clothing. Yeah. And they also looked at, like, there was. Uh, when the material was dumped on the tipping floor, if they found like a, a big umbrella, like a patio umbrella, we know that's treated. So they were definitely looking for ones that we suspected would be a source, which made some sense. So I know they did cut up some umbrellas. They did find some Gore-Tex material when they did the testing. So I mean, in a sense, it was targeted for it, but yet it, it, it was quite informative as well. We go to the next slide. I'm now going to look at uh, the analysis for the leachate. So this is just a, so if you remember back in 2018, we did one round of sampling. We have five landfills in Vermont, four are closed, and the news Vermont remains open that we capture and uh, require the disposal of the leachate at wastewater treatment facilities. So in this next sampling round, we did eight different sampling events. And we wanted to see if there was uh, much variability in what's being generated at these landfills. And this is just by the different compounds. So the very top is the total PFAS. The next one down is PFOA. And you can see the rest. My isolate's not quite as good. But really what that told us is even though the top line does show variability, if you look at by the individual compounds, it's really pretty consistent, in my opinion. And it's showing that our, you know, what we throw out in landfills has these compounds and they're pretty much continuing, continuously leaching out into the leachate. And then this took a look at the uh, different sampling events that we did. You'll notice there's only four on there. We had uh, problems getting access to the Moortown landfill. So we had had sampled the Moortown landfill in the past, and they refused to cooperate uh, with us in this study. So we went ahead without them. But you'll see Chittenden, Solid Waste, Closed Landfill, City of Burlington, News Vermont, and Randolph. And I think the surprising thing is the uh, fact that Randolph was the highest. We're not 100% certain on the reason for that, although there are some reports in our files that shows that some waste from Bennington, uh, ChemFab, St. Cobain went to Randolph, and that could very well be a source. Randolph was one of the first of the landfills that realized that the practice of putting dirt on top of the landfill every night um, and then doing it again every day that it was open was filling up the landfill with a lot of dirt. 
disturbed. So they um, changed their policy and said they would uh, take they take uh, trash from as far away as Burlington and other places, so they could fill it all up without and get more in it instead of having to you know, put that dirt on it every night. And then this is when landfills were were closing and trying to uh, get more stuff in there in in them without. So that, yeah, I'm not was surprised. The earlier line yeah. landfills too. Yeah, so it was yeah. supposed to last 12 or year, 13 years, and I think it was three years, and so it was cheaper to collect the money and then subsidize and send it out again later. Right. So this was just another way to look at the, 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 the line chart I showed before to, to highlight that pretty much every one of these landfills that are producing leachate do have the PFAS compounds in them. I didn't get that. <laughs> I'm not, not going to repeat it for a while. <laughs> Come on. We go to the next one. So now we'll look at what we discovered in the influent effluent at the wastewater treatment facilities. And this next graph is a lot to absorb, but I, I shared it because it shows all the different land, uh, wastewater treatment facilities that we tested. So that's really the takeaway and the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, the wastewater treatment facilities that accept leachate <coughs> definitely the highest concentration, um, uh, that had the highest concentrations in their facility, and that would be Mount Pillier and Newport. Uh, we also see, I think it's um, Burlington and I believe Rutland was relatively high. So we're still trying to figure out what that ultimately means, but it's sort of a good breakout. And the way these... Uh, so may I ask, so I'm just looking at Newport compared to Bennington. Mm -hmm. So Newport is showing a higher concentration just in the in the influent effluent. Or in the effluent. Correct. Okay. Correct. Both. So the influent is the white bar yeah. and the let's call it red for Valentine's Day, the red bar is the effluent. And uh, the, the range of the sampling, because we did eight different events, are the colored pieces. And then if you see those bars, those are the uh, 95th percentile for statistics purposes. So not being a really strong statistician, let's stay away from that. But really, you can see the range. And, and with Bennington, it would be interesting, we haven't done that, to look at what the, the results would be before we did all the treatment, because there used to be private wells that had high levels that would discharge to the sewer system. So we saw some pretty high levels in Bennington initially, but now that we have them all on clean water, we have seen those numbers come down. I haven't done that look to see, but I'd be surprised if Bennington wasn't a lot higher if we threw in prior to the work we've done. Does Newport uh, include, uh, are, were any samples taken when they were accepting um, leachate? Seven of the eight were <coughs> when they were accepting leachate. So there's only one round of sampling that was after they stopped accepting. So we're going to continue to monitor that to see if we start to see trends going down, which we would expect to see. But we really didn't see that with the one sampling event. It was lower, but it wasn't significantly lower. Hmm. So the take home said, no surprise, if they're accepting lead shape, then you end up with the influent levels oh, significantly higher. But there's, but there's a background level of PFAS and influent everywhere. Right, and I have a, a another <coughs> figure to kind of show that. We go to the next one. So before we go on, is that why both Montpelier and Newport are higher? Because they both accept other inputs? Or, or is that, this isn't just coming from the city of Montpelier and the city well, of Newport? Sure. Is Montpelier is, is interesting because it serves as a hub for the treatment of a lot of the septage that gets pumped out of the individual homeowner wastewater uh, mm -hmm. uh, wastewater. And systems. I know Newport takes a fair amount as well. Right, and, and we've 
seen that there are relatively high concentrations in single family home uh -huh. septage. So this isn't well, necessarily reflective of down down down. handling the sludge? I, I think it's, I think, I, again, I think one of the things that's really hard is to take limited data sets and then leap to conclusions. I mean, certainly leachate, I mean, I think it shows a trend that if, if facilities accept leachate, they're higher than those that don't. But everybody has PFAS in it. And with Montpelier, I think you know it is somewhat unique in how the facility operates, and you kind of have to factor that in when you look at Montpelier. That's correct. If we go to the next one, that kind of shows it. So the first bar on the left, again, the, the colored section is the, the range, the low and the high for the eight different rounds. But you can see that that is Mount Pillar and Newport. And the next one is all the facilities that accept leachate. The next one is they don't know leachate, but do have some industrial sources. So there are some industry that could be contributing. And then the green one way to the right are wastewater treatment facilities that have no leachate and no known industrial sources contributing. So as Matt said, even if you get take out the, the sources that we know contribute, there still is PFAS coming into our wastewater treatment facilities from our residential use. And to try to fully understand that is something we're working on. I can say we don't fully understand what's contributing to it. We're going to have to go back to the fur. There you go. Hey, good. No PFAS and fur, no natural stuff. Well, I like it. Okay, next one is uh, looking at, so look, so we know the material comes into the plant at, with some varying concentrations. We know it will accumulate or have some affinity to accumulate in biosolids, but we also know that the wastewater treatment facilities aren't really designed to remove the PFAS. So we see some coming out the effluent. And it's the same breakdown of the different categories, the Mount Hillier, Newport, uh, other, all of them that accept leachate, and then the leachate with industrial and then no industrial. And if we think back to our, and this is in parts per trillion, so if we think back to our drinking water standard, the green one is discharging below 20. The next two are below or slightly above 40. And then the next one is at 80 to 90 at the high range. So it's above drinking water standards. We know no one's drinking what's coming out of a pipe at a wastewater treatment facility, but at the same time, we don't know if the constant loading of PFAS, even at those very low concentrations, are contributing to a problem, say, in fish or other aquatic biota. But we do know that it's going into surface waters that are then drawn from for drinking water. It, we, we do, but then we also have tested the, yeah, but then we've tested the drinking water and of course, it's not. It gets diluted, <laughs> right, of right, right. And so with, with the sampling at Mount Pillar, we did do three separate rounds of above stream and below stream. And not surprising, they were not attacked because we know it's low concentrations mm -hmm. being heavily diluted. Yeah. That still doesn't mean it's not an issue, mm -hmm. but at least from a drinking water perspective, for now. For now. Right. But it'll continue to build up over time, wherever we put it. We know that at least the PFOS will bioaccumulate. Do we know at what levels in fish we don't have that data? I think the other thing just to sort of note and anticipate a question if you go back and look through this, I mean, you will notice that the influent data is lower than the affluent data. And while we don't know with certainty what is going on, our working understanding is, is that it's likely that wastewater treatment plants are taking PFAS compounds that we can't detect and breaking them down into PFAS compounds that we hmm. do see. So there's some. Um, Longer chain. There's some longer chain. Well, it's probably, we're not sure. And I think that that's, again, I think it's something that we've sort of flagged as uh, something we need to do additional work in figuring out how this is, what's happening. 
So uh, can you remind us exactly what the 20, you know, we talked about 20 parts per billion as a safe drinking water standard, but that was evaluating, I'm just trying to remember what the risks were associated with it. Was it that in exceedance of that, it had potential as a carcinogen or a teratogen or a disruptor or something? I mean, I don't know, what are we saying? 20 is a threshold for our <laughs> water. Well, so, so, so basically it's, it's looking at non-cancer endpoints and it's primarily kidney, kidney function and there's, I believe, some uh, uh, fetal development function. Mm -hmm. that's that's the big one. And I think that's the big one. And um, it, it's a chronic exposure level looking at the most sensitive populations for purposes of so again, we're not looking at acute uh, sort of endpoints. We're looking at chronic endpoints. Um, that so. Okay. And are you evaluating it, or is the Department of Health evaluating it as an endocrine disruptor? Or, or well, that's one of the known impacts, and the health department has factored that into their calculations and for sure. Just because this summer, when we in the single-use products work group, we have testimony. From Dr. Meyer down, um, I think at Johns Hopkins. Anyway, you get the citation, but he was, he in passing was talking about PFAS and said as an endocrine disruptor that it was, a, they thought the safe, the highest <coughs> was one tenth of one part per trillion. So a far lower threshold. And I, it just made me pause and say, okay, we're using a threshold and what are we not evaluating for? What other sorts of health risks? So I, I think there is some emerging information on PFAS's effects on the immune system and potential adverse effects. I, I, I think that is emerging and I don't think that it's been sort of, uh, I think we're waiting on places like ATSDR and others to finalize their research um, and I, uh, I think that the health department, once it gets finalized, will take that into consideration with respect to their standards. Thank you. Next one, please. So sludges and biosolids. So again, not surprising uh, for facilities that accept leachate had the highest concentrations of PFAS compounds. It's the average sum of five. So the same three kind of categories, the ones that accept leachate, the ones that accept industrial, and then the ones that don't have either. And a takeaway is just as we reported before, higher for facilities that accept leachate, but still present in uh, facilities that don't accept leachate. And handbrands per liter translates into what? In terms of parts per? That's really, no, that's truly. So if we go to the next one. So this looks at um, sampling that was done by Casella, sampling that was done by us, and then our, to put some context in it, we threw in um, our background study that we did. So if we start with a background study first, we collected it. It was really part of our work in Bennington to understand uh, what background was, and so we collected throughout the entire state, it was about 69, 67 samples uh, in town common areas, in, in places where there wasn't an obvious industrial source, and in every sample that we took, we found some low levels of PFAS, generally speaking in the one to two part per billion range. And so then when we look at the sampling that we did, which is the middle column of um, PFAS, uh, of the sludges of all those different wastewater facilities that I listed before, we had the highest concentrations of the different compounds, with PFOS being really the highest for really all three. And then the sampling to the far left is the sampling that Casella did for sludges that came in. So we do know that it is in sludges. It's in the part per billion range. 
which again, if our standards part per trillion, it's a thousand times more, but it's still, uh, part per billion I still consider a low concentration, but it's there. So last year when we talked about the possibility of a moratorium on spreading sludge, all those kinds of things, we thought, all right, we're gonna hold off, we're gonna get some information. Is this the information that, is this where we are sort of at with regard to the information that we need to make those kinds of decisions, or is there more out there that's being done that this committee needs to have a look at? Yes, so okay. this is just looking at the sludges themselves. So what we've done, my group has done it, it's gone out, and we've done some initial sampling ourselves at facilities that accepted the biosolids, and then we've requested all, any uh, of the facilities, the properties that we've permitted, that they do the sampling. We have not gotten all the results in. The ones that we've gotten in show some properties are showing very little impact, and a few are showing some high levels of impact in groundwater. The good news is none are showing any uh, contamination to drinking water wells, mm -hmm. which is really the biggest exposure route that we want to be protective of. But we have at least one property that we're concerned about that um, we're asking for. It's um, by the monitor barns in Richmond, and they take both municipal sludge as well as septage. And there are some very high, fairly high levels of soil and groundwater. But we know that we're spreading it, right? I mean, we know that through this process, we are spreading PFASs throughout the state. And we, as a state, have to just determine whether or not we go continue that practice or find a better way to manage these. Right. I mean, well, I think that's, I mean, so you're- I mean, that, that's what we've always been talking about. Sure. And I, I'm, I'm just, maybe you can help me in Shep, just to get, well, so at you're, what point do we, as a committee, start to say, I mean, we found it now in the king, I mean, it's everywhere, and our, we're making a situation maybe worse. Do we want, um, you know, just help me. Sure, so obviously that's a policy question. Right. right. The committee can take up when it feels it has enough information. The agency is is going out, as Chuck said, and looking at both soil and groundwater results from places that actually land apply, so that yeah. we can have a better understanding of whether we're having accumulation in soils and, and what impacts we're seeing in groundwater. I think the challenge is you can't stop accumulating sludges, right? That's a fun, it's a Absolutely. process of, of, of operating the wastewater treatment yeah. facility. And the, the alternative management options for them are relatively limited. It's incineration, and I would just that put on the table. That's well, what happened with right. Benny. Well, I was very to say, I think the agency would voice a concern about right. any incineration of sludges, um, either land application, um, taking them to a landfill for disposal there. Um, and I guess your other alternative is just out-of-state shipment to any of the similar uh, issues. So I, I think we're still trying to come up with both a scope of the, what the problem is, but yeah. I think we're also in the process of evaluating several options that we can do regulatorily um, to try and both uh, improve our understanding and minimize impacts. And but I, we're not prepared today to sort of make any sort of decisions as to sure. how we're going to move forward yet. And the way I'm feeling, and it's just, is that I think we all know that this practice, we can't, this, this, this means we can't continue. We've got to manage it in a better way. We've got to make that decision sooner rather than later in terms of how are we going to manage this most effectively. And uh, so I feel like, you know, we're postponing, we're postponing, we can get more information, and I respect that, and we're trying to understand the gravity of the problem, but we know it's a big problem. And, and to me, it's, it's can we manage it within our facilities in the state, or can it go somewhere else where somebody can manage it better? Yeah, and so, I, if I could just weigh in, I think that's an excellent question. I think what Matt said is really the crux for me in my program is if we say no to land app and we know there's a lot of positives for adding biosolids as a soil amendment, is the alternative that we're taking it to 
more protective. I know. And we don't right. have that answer, right. and I know that's what we right. have to struggle right. with, but I might argue is putting, bringing it to the landfill, we've just looked at the leachate numbers, yeah. maybe is not a better right. alternative. So then again, I think that we have to come back to this committee and say, how can we help the landfills in a way to make that process better? Right. I mean, it is. This is complicated stuff, and it's going to be a tough decision. It's going to take some money, but I think we're just putting it off and putting it off. So. Can I, I want to do a math check on myself here. So we're looking at a scale of parts per billion. So if we went to our drinking water standard of parts per trillion, that 20, for instance, becomes 20,000 parts per trillion, right? So it's a thousand fold yeah. over, you know, I just want to, which is a little hard to imagine to, to see, I see why you need to draw it that way, otherwise it's completely off the charts, but it's, I'm wanting one, <coughs> check my math, and two, it, it looks sort of reassuringly like the other profiles, but it's really an intense source of um, PFAS compounds, right? It is definitely accumulating. Thank you. Next. So uh, this is just a little summary of the uh, report that the um, that Castell and News Vermont did. Uh, they hired Brown and Caldwell to look at the two on-site and two off-site. And we've just highlighted some of the challenges when we've asked them to look at that. What's really important is to understand, okay, what level are we treating to? What is the discharge standard? And without a water, surface water quality standard, which we don't have yet, it was somewhat difficult in this research to, to figure out exact costs. Um, the other real challenge with leachate, because it is a very complex matrix and, and uh, highly organic material, actually treating it is pretty challenging. So understanding exactly what makes the most sense in a cost-effective and environmentally effective way was one of the, the limitations that Brown and Caldwell highlighted. And that, as I mentioned earlier, there's, they still, in these reports, didn't really resolve the final, what do you do with the, if you concentrate uh, a solid or a liquid with highly, highly uh, concentrated PFAS, what do we do with that? And they didn't really answer those questions. So what we are doing as a, as a state program, we have some very talented people in-house, but I don't think we have the full expertise. So we've asked uh, for an independent analysis of by a third party to review their report, um, to look at in the seller report, did they look at all the options? Were their assumptions right? Are their costs right? Uh, did they miss some critical components of it? And we've just recently closed our request for proposal process. We got a few proposals in and we're hoping we'll be able to get a contractor on board quickly to start helping us go through that. Uh, report and I think it's safe to say no decisions on what direction we go, at least at a department level, will go forward until we get that review done. If you want to add anything to that. Is that a report that you uh, can send to the committee? Absolutely, yes. right? Yeah. The, the, the analysis of, yes. Of our independent third party or the Brown and Caldwell? The, 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 the one you already Yep, yeah, that, that is available on our website. I'll send you the link to it. And then just lastly, Matt mentioned in the beginning, the other thing we, look, we were tasked to look at as part of our statewide sampling plan was car washes and electroplaters. Um, so we've, in both cases, we've identified what we consider to be the highest risk car washes, in other words, what car washes are located in locations where there's um, private drinking water wells in close proximity. Uh, so we did testing at 17 of those, of which we detected PFAS at four locations with exceedances at two, and this would be in groundwater. And it, uh, the good news, like the Biosolids Land app, is we did not see any impacts on surrounding drinking water supplies. 
So we know it's there, we know it's impacting groundwater, but we're not necessarily seeing the human exposure. The same can be true with electroplaters. Um, we detected PFAS at two of the five locations that we've sampled. Uh, in both car washes and electroplaters, we're still working on getting additional testing data in. Both were of more challenging than we thought because we didn't necessarily have evidence of a release. So when we're asking for this testing, we're truly asking and not requiring under the law. So not everyone has been openly willing to allow us to do this testing. So uh, that's why we have limited uh, facilities tested so far, but we're continuing to work through that and, and should have more data as, as time progresses. So are any of these facilities, uh, do they have alternative processes or chemicals they can use and are they interested and or willing to make changes or? Absolutely, excellent question. It's something that I wish we all knew more of as what are the safer alternatives. I will say there's a lot of attention regionally and nationally to understand that. So we can try at least in part to educate consumers and businesses for safer alternatives, but we don't, me personally, I don't feel like we have that information yet to really, like some of these that are marketed as safer, are they really safer? Do they still have fluorinated compounds in it? I think we're finding many still do. Well, so even if they're completely different compounds, if we, if we don't have a history from them and there's not been a lot of testing, we still don't know if they're safer. Exactly right. Yeah. So then, quick, going off the slides, but quickly giving the committee an update on the water quality standard report and the status of that. So we also put out a report with respect to the water quality standards. Um, and basically, the, in, in summary, uh, we found that there are significant data gaps that need to be filled in order for us to establish a water quality standard uh, for the five PFAS compounds. There's no data available with respect to bioaccumulation of these five PFAS compounds in ecological, uh, and there's insufficient uh, toxicological, ecological toxicological data for uh, three of the five PFAS compounds. Um, it's relatively, uh, it would be a relatively significant cost to fill those data gaps, somewhere in the range of three to six million dollars. Um, in lieu of doing that, the agency is recommending that we set a fish consumption advisory, much like we do with mercury. Um, we do have sufficient data to set fish consumption advisories. Um, and so we're in the process of developing that and then doing the, uh, including PFAS in the fish tissue sampling regime that we do as an agency so that we'll have an understanding of what levels of PFAS are in fish tissue and whether we're seeing them rise to a level um, that we have a human consumption issue associated with them. In addition to that, and I think it sort of flows through a lot of the things that we spoke to, uh, we're also looking to develop a working group in concert with municipalities to basically uh, make an effort to uh, identify industrial and other sources discharging into wastewater treatment facilities and whether there are feasible alternatives or treatment alternatives for those industrial sources so that you basically can address them before they get into the wastewater treatment facility. Um, and lastly, continue our collaboration with uh, Nui Pick, which is the regional organization of, of clean water administrators throughout New England and, and EPA, to try and get some of the science pushed to a point where we can move forward with standards. Can you um, send over a memo to the committee with timelines for these? And you have uh, quite a few moving parts. And so if you could tell us, for instance, there's also the study related to can we regulate as a class, right? Sure. Um, so if you could give us timelines, I'm guessing, and chart style, there's things going on now, there's things that haven't started yet, there's things that are going to be going on for years. It would be helpful just to see how that work is unfolding. Sure. Thank you. Senator Rogers. So on the fish thing, Matt, I'm guessing that the fish would be affected only really in the big lakes, much more than they're affected in the upland lakes? You know, I don't 
think we have enough data to draw okay. conclusions, right? I mean, I think the, the challenge is PFOS, and particularly PFOS, it bioaccumulate in differently than sort of like the other bioaccumulating constituents that we see. It doesn't go into fatty tissue, it goes into bloodstream and muscular tissue. Um, so it's really different and uh, I think it's posing some unique issues for uh, our aquatic ecologists to try and, and I, I, so I just don't want to, I don't think we can draw conclusions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That would be an interesting story to follow. Yeah. That would turn out. We did just for knowledge in Bennington, we did test some fish and the predominant contaminant there was PFOA. Excuse me. But not surprisingly, what we found in the fish tissue was PFOS. Hmm. So it was bioaccumulating from where? where? From, yeah, did, from where? We did, don't did you know. test anything that was upstream? No, uh, mm -hmm. it was a lake here with Like Karen? Like Karen, Karen. So. so is that upstream or downstream uh, of the other contamination is what I'm wondering. Well, I mean, the, the challenge with PFAS is that we're finding that aerial deposition is a fairly significant source, and that clearly was the case in Bennington. So a lot there of is no upstream or downstream. Okay, so depending on what way the wind was blowing. Yes. Gotcha. So following up on this, so if your take took those fish from the Walloon Sack River, popular fly fishing spot for the state, isn't there a connection between the Walloon Sack and the Bennington uh, wastewater treatment plant? Yeah, I would imagine. I, I, right. I, I, don't know where the, I don't know where the discharge point for the, the treatment plant is. So. Can you find out? Yeah, I can. Sure. The, 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 Levels that we found were considered to be uh, well below what would be a concern to the health department. Right. So that was the good news, the bad news, it was there. The, if there was good news at the time, they didn't felt, feel it was at a concentration that was of a health concern. Right. And I think, you know, again, kind of going back to the we don't understand the ecological toxicity to fish. So, I mean, mm -hmm. yes, we're focused right now on human consumption and the effects on the human but the impact, but we're not, we are equally concerned about fish populations, the diversity of fish populations and their ability to basically function properly. And that that's another sort of facet that we look at when we're setting water quality standards and there's a lot of them missing data. It might make them more waterproof. <laughs> they swim a lot. It flies right out of them. Yeah. It makes them harder to catch. Cause like, yeah. well, that's what I was going to say. It, with, well, the the fisher, with the fishermen that, I, the fishermen that I hang out with, we don't really have to worry about <laughs> the limits that we eat. It's more about can you catch them? Uh, Fair enough. I'm with you on that. Do you evaluate hydrolysis at all as a management technique for accumulated beef fats or chemicals? I mean, I've, It'd be I've broken down by heat, right? Because pyrolysis is a low oxygen burn. So, or, or any or heat related thing. I, mean, I have I keep hearing about waste being destroyed by high temperature combustion, but my concern is about what's happening along with that combustion. But is that something you're looking into? So I, I think it's fair to say no. We are not we are not doing any of the basic research associated with the, the effectiveness of treatment technologies. It's sort of beyond A and R's capacity to look at those sorts of things. And I, I guess I would only add, uh, there is at this moment. You guys correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, as of recently, there is no validated testing methodology for looking at air emissions of the cross, Right. So. Again, I think this is the challenge with emerging contaminants is that we, we don't have a, a, a QA, QC, EPA approved um, air emissions testing methodology yet. So we can't say, I don't feel comfortable sort of definitively saying that these tests that we may have seen from a certain facility that says it's fine are, are courtroom defensively and accurate from a lawyer's standpoint. Um, I, Great. Well, um, we've run over a little, and this. So, thank you for coming in and giving us. Uh, I, I can see you've done 
a great deal of work since we last sat together uh, talking about this last year and appreciate all that uh, diligent effort. And um, we'll come back to this. I think the, the open question for the committee is, is there anything else that we should be doing? We don't want to just be hyper-reactive. Uh, we also want to be you know, appropriately assertive in trying to address things as uh, to the limits of what we know is, uh, you know, practical or feasible. Uh, keep pushing. I mean, I think the response is, is that we, we've spent a lot of time gathering data and have not had it long enough to give you good sort of science-based policy solutions for what you should be doing with it. And I think that that's sort of our, what's sort of on our task list right now is really trying to understand what this data is telling us and whether it's sufficiently representative and what sort of policy solutions you should be drawing from it. I think my other thing, question would be, is there, back to how landfills are using, is, is there a landfill, is there a technology out there that's more sophisticated, more advanced than what we're seeing here in the state of Vermont? You know, we keep talking about, right, so it's, it's like you're going somewhere, you know, if New York State can handle it better without polluting, without us, without us creating a terrible problem for New York State, perhaps we should, should be thinking about that. I don't think okay. every state. I mean, I know a lot of chip no, know, is, is there a technology goes to Shattagay, New York, and I don't know if there if their situation is yeah, there. Are we just maintaining their groundwater there? That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, right. I, I, I'm again. I think, especially with landfill leachate, I think everybody, the the regulatory community has identified that it's a, it's an issue, it's a challenge, yeah. it's something that we're going to have to deal with. I think. We have a report that, I, that we're trying to evaluate and then, then reach conclusions. In Maine's moratorium doesn't seem to have worked, right? In a way, did it create more of a problem than? Uh, yeah, I think so, because their, their level that they picked was so low, it was below like our background. So. OK. And I think they so, it's, they, they, so if they had picked a higher level, maybe their moratorium may have. And they found work workarounds. So right. although it's the level that you... Maybe we can hear from me. Well, I mean, just to see, get a sense from their folks. Sure, we can, or we can provide you at some point a summary of what Maine's program is and what... Oh, you directly from me. I'm just kidding. No, you, that's fine. <laughs> so the rest of the committee is going to take up a collection and send it to me. Right. There you go. They've been trying to do that for years. <laughs> <laughs> Maine right. Main friends. <laughs> Main friends. <laughs> so thank you again. Thank you all. Well, it's great. Uh, thank you for your time. I mean, helpful. We have in, um, there's, uh, in the building, in S267, there's a, a bill that proposes to change the uh, standards in the renewable energy standard. That was The bill started in natural resources and energy. We uh, committed it over to finance that wanted to get uh, a head start on it. It's, it's still in finance, but we know the bill will be coming back to us. So uh, we wanted to uh, get educating ourselves on some of the implications of proposals in that bill. Someone asked me why I was a sponsor if I wasn't sure that I wanted to do everything in that bill. I said it was a way to get a, a conversation going, get some ideas on the table, and now we need to do our due diligence to figure out uh, what the implications of enacting any or all of those provisions are. And to help us do that, we wanted to speak to people who are in the business of dealing with generating and moving energy around. So. Uh, like to uh, get started this morning. Mr. Prisoner, would you join us at the table? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Uh, so my name is Hans Quigley, uh, manager of system planning at Velco. I've uh, been at Velco for the last 20 years, and 10 years prior to that, I was at Boston Edison, uh, which was a vertically integrated utility. Um, since then, there's quite a bit of change in the industry. Uh, the industry was regulated. Uh, got a lot of gas right now. Units are being tired. The grid is becoming more more renewable and modernizing the grid. And that's happening really rapidly in Vermont. We've seen a great large increase in solar PV and other resources. Um, and Velco is here to to help to ensure that the system remains reliable as we do it. 
we pay attention to our resources, how they uh, perform, uh, and that affects how we design the grid. So that's always all about reliability. Uh, reliability is defined by uh, NERC, federal uh, uh, organizations, regional organizations, and to do that, we have a control center uh, in our uh, in Rutland. We develop a long-range plan every three years. We perform annual assessments for the NERC standards. We also manage the Vermont System Plan Committee, uh, BSPC. And I would begin by saying that our policies are, are working. Uh, we've seen a very drastic change in our load in Vermont. Uh, we've seen the soil be affecting reducing our peak demand. Uh, it's also reducing the load in the middle of the day quite a bit. So that actually has quite, a, quite an effect. On this slide here, I'm showing the numbers uh, every year. Uh, for instance, 2015, the midday load dropped by 37 megawatts. 2016, it dropped again by 35 megawatts. and picked up in 2017, 69, and also flooding is these values on this current year, and the last measurement was in 2019, where the load in the middle of the day dropped to 300 megawatts in Vermont. And we have a, a system that I call a 1,000 megawatt system at peak. On a typical day, we're about 650 megawatts. So that we're really low, and it's getting even lower as we go along. And we project 2032. I looked up uh, a presentation that the department gave to ICO New England stating that we need about 25 megawatts a year to meet the tier two requirements today. And if we just plot that 25 megawatts a year, Vermont, the entire state, low in the middle of the day would be about zero uh, in 732. And I actually believe that it will happen earlier than that. Uh, I think uh, we can have more than 25 megawatts per year as we go along just to excuse the market forces. And if you look at this in terms of the load shape on a typical day, in April or May, and I'm plotting from 2015 to, to now, uh, the middle of the day load tends to be about 600, 750 megawatts, and it's been dropping over the years. And for, you can see some interesting things as you look at these shapes. In 2017, for instance, the load in the middle of the day was lower than a nighttime load. That was the first time this happened in Vermont. And continuing to drop below the uh, 2019, we're 300 megawatts, and that's certainly below the nighttime nighttime load. And and the reason for that is solar PV. Uh, there's no other no other reason for that. And if I project what will happen in 2032, we'll see that load drop to zero megawatts in the middle of the day, but it will not have any impact at the peak hours. That is at six, you know, eight o'clock at night or 4 o'clock in the morning, there's no sun, right? So these loads will remain as they are today, but in the middle of the day will drop significantly. That's the effect that we're, we're projecting. As we go to the next slide, this is showing how we serve load in Vermont on a peak hour, whether it's the winter peak or the summer peak. And this is showing that over 75% of our supply comes from outside of our borders. Uh, we import that power through our transmission ties, whether it's from New York, Canada, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. And internal resources in Vermont are mostly renewable. Uh, look at the wind, or solar, or hydro. But depending on the time of, of the peak, which is late at night, from 6 o'clock or 9 o'clock, we have very little solar at that time. Um, it's a little, bit, a little bit of wind. We even have storage. For the first time, we had storage serving load in Vermont uh, around the peak hour. About 6 megawatts last winter, and about 1 megawatt this summer. And this is going to grow going forward. Uh, so let's talk about our long-range plan. Um, so we publish a plan every three years. The last plan was published in 2018. Uh, what we found in our analysis is that we're going to continue to be reliant on our transmission grid uh, to import power, particularly at the peak hour. And because our 
resources are intermittent, they're weather dependent, whether it's hydro, wind, or solar, uh, we are going to continue to use our transmission system to serve our load in Vermont. And in terms of the peak, our forecast is showing that, at least in the near term, in the last 10 years, our peak load will stay constant, uh, even drop, because of in solar PV and other things we're doing, like energy efficiency, demand response, load flexibility. So we don't foresee any needs to upgrade the system for for purpose of serving load. But in terms of integrating new energy, depending on how much is actually added to the system and where it's located, there may be a need for transmission grids. And we may be able to reduce that need by doing things like load management, storage. Uh, we could try to optimize the location of generation to align with capacity, the transmission, the grid capacity. We can use um, even curtailment to some extent. That's the you know, least cost option. So we tested two scenarios in our wellness plan. We tested 500 megawatts, which we think uh, due to natural <coughs> market forces or current policies, it's probably what the low, uh, generation is going to be. And we also tested 1,000 megawatts. And that is to be consistent with the solar pathway study that PIC conducted uh, under DOE contract. Uh, and I'll go over these results a little later in the presentation. So if you go to the next, next slide, what we found when we tested 500 megawatts in Cremento, in Vermont, we found that our system losses increased. Uh, typically, when you add generation on the distribution level, you expect the losses to go down. But there's so much generation that this additional flow on the system to support that. Additional flow results in additional losses. Uh, and so if you compare a system without generation, we lost solar PV, and with generation, it's like a snapshot. The only thing that would change was the amount of solar. The impact is an increase in losses on the system. That's a quick question. Um, the 500 was chosen how? Does that reflect, uh, I'm just trying to relate that, that part of like uh, an energy plan that the state has or that? It, uh, it, it reflects our current current policies. Yep. Uh, the, the tier one uh, of the res, uh, of the res. It also uses a, what we call a payback model that takes into account the economics of solar installation. That is, we're trying to model customer behavior based on the perceived economic value of, of solar. And that model suggests that in 2028 or so, there will be about 500 megawatts of solar in Vermont. So it's a natural economic payback model. So the 1,000 megawatt is, is not a, that's a forecast, it's a high solar scenario and to, to test the system uh, in, uh, in a way that is stressed, so, so beyond what we think will, will happen, we, to see how the system will perform. Um, and what we found is that the, the constraints that we have today in the northern portion of the state, an area we call Sheffield Highgate Export Interface, which we've not heard of before, um, or SHIA for short, uh, we found issues in northern Vermont, voltage collapse, which is sort of a, a blackout. We found lines, transmission lines overloaded, exceed their capacity. Uh, and that would extend further south into the Georgia area as you add more and more solar. Uh, and so at 1,000, that's even worse. It, it went even further south towards the West Belton area. Um, so there's significant transmission grid impacts. Uh, which could be addressed in several ways. And we've looked at those ways in the uh, long range plan. We looked at certainly um, transmission upgrades. We also looked at storage as a sort of non-transmission alternative to resolving these issues. And what we also did in our plan is to indicate where solar or generation could be installed in Vermont without, uh, or at least to minimize grid impacts. Um, and so that we call that transmission system hosting capacity. And we'll, we'll show you that map here as well. And the, I'm guessing that if the, whether it's 500 or 1,000, 
depending on the increments that you're injecting and the number of locations you're injecting, it has an impact on the whole system as well, right? Correct. So and your model walks through more concentrated versus more distributed? Exactly. The location is very important. Uh, it's, uh, so you have to match the, the amount that you're adding to the system to the capacity of the local area. And as we talk about storage as a potential solution, uh, you usually talk about battery storage, but there's other other means of uh, providing the same the same service. Um, essentially, what storage does is it, it, it moves energy from one part of the load curve to another part of the load curve, um, so it essentially flattens the daily load curve. You can do that with um, Load management, for instance, or, or other technologies. It, it, it could be batteries, but also it could be pumped hydro or other things like that. Um, we can use storage to provide market benefits, uh, participate in the energy market, with the right capacity or, or frequency regulation. Um, Velco has looked at storage as a, a potential transmission asset, and currently the rules don't allow us to to uh, put storage in our transmission rates. Uh, FERC does not allow that. It's, it's, actually, it's actually being discussed now. Uh, there's a case in front of FERC to talk about storage as a transmission asset, so we'll continue to follow that. Um, and really, when we use storage, the, the attributes that are, I think, are needed is for drop, the cost of drops, right? The cost is very high currently. Um, we would need a long-term storage in longer than four hours. Uh, one, a one-hour storage, a two-hour storage, that will, I don't think will be sufficient to address the concerns that we're trying to address here. Uh, and if you exercise storage quite a bit, it's kind of like your, your battery in your computer. As you use it a lot, it depletes, and you have to replace it. Uh, and, and so grid storage is the same thing. If you exercise it quite a bit frequently, it, it loses uh, charge, and and you have to replace it for um, within five or ten years. And like everything else, I mean, storage is, in, is connected to the grid through uh, uh, converters like solar PV and other, other generators. Um, and what we recommend is that anything that generation that connects to the grid has to provide grid support. Be able to support voltage, provide frequency support, connect inertia, and you can dispatch it based on your needs. So that's, that's critical for for storage to be successful. And how, what's the um, sort of roles and responsibilities between Velco and the distribution utilities in terms of storage? You know, is that uh, sometimes I, why might a DU have a storage versus Velco have storage? And how do you square those two relationships so that sure. they're not just counting on you to do it or you're not counting on them to do it, for instance? Right, it's a great, great question. Uh, Velco being a transmission only utility, uh, there, there are certain parameters that we have to follow. For instance, we do not use storage to, uh, to participate in the market. We're not allowed to do that. We can't uh, use storage for energy or for, uh, for capacity. We can use storage to support operations, uh, meaning if we have a transmission line or a substation um, that is deficient in terms of its ability to serve load, instead of replacing a transformer or upgrading a line, we could install storage to provide the capacity that we need. Uh, so it's, we can use storage specifically for system support, uh, and, and, uh, and utilities can use that for other, other means. I mean, they're fairly integrated, they have generators already. They can use storage to reduce their load, they can use storage to uh, to uh, provide energy, capacity, frequency regulation, and that, that's actually occurring today. Thank you. <coughs> and uh, so this slide here, slide nine, talks about the analysis that we did in our long-range plan. As we, what we did here is that we compared transmission capacity <coughs> to uh, the amount of generation that would be added in certain parts of, of uh, the state we divided the state in 16 different zones. And these, these zones here are those that are limited in terms of their capacity. Uh, you know, Newport and Highgate are, in the, are located in the Shia area that we're talking about. 
Um, St. Albans is just, just below that. Um, and so when we compared the amount that wants to connect to these areas to transmission capacity, um, and if we're going to dissolve these constraints with storage, we're able to estimate the amount of energy that would be required to be charged or absorbed by storage and the capacity that we need. Uh, and the numbers that you see in, in red are the cost estimate um, to, to, to actually install these storage devices. Adding all these numbers, we see that the cost will exceed about $900 million. And I think that's the, probably a lower number than what will happen in reality because we, didn't, we did not uh, try to size the storage device to take into account uh, state of charge management, whether you want the storage to be at 10% normally or 50% normally. Uh, and so the amount that will actually connect will be larger than what we have here in this, in this, uh, this table. Um, there's a, a lot in this slide. You can uh, look at those a little later. I've actually included a link. If you wanted to see how these costs were estimated, you can follow the approach there as well. Thank you. I just want to briefly uh, talk about the constraint area in northern Vermont, uh, the Sheffield Highgate Export Interface. Uh, this is an interface that ISO New England manages um, to ensure that system capacity is not exceeded. Uh, there's, there's quite a bit of generation there. It's over 400 megawatts of resources, including the Highgate uh, ADC converter, and only about 60 megawatts on peak, about 30 megawatts on average. And so the transmission capacity is not sufficient to export the excess power to other parts of Vermont. And generation is being curtailed by ISO New England when there's excessive generation in northern Vermont. I use that slide as a um, to introduce what we discussed in the long-range plan. In that, when we model a thousand megawatt in Vermont of uh, solar PV or generation. And we don't do that in a way that minimizes system impact. We've found that several lines on the transmission system would exceed their capacity. And they're uh, shown here in, in orange, especially the western side of the state, from Highgate down to West Scotland would be affected. And there are a few things that affect that. So it's generation up north, but also what we're importing from other parts of uh, um, the system from New York, from our PV20 Kai, and from Canada, uh, from the Highgate Converter. These are injections from the north that are also causing issues with generation. And the shear area, the boundary of that shear area, if we don't do things uh, smartly, we don't install storage in the right locations, that area will drop further south. The additional constraints, meaning other resources today that are not being curtailed, will become uh, subject to curtailments by ISO, like the McNeil generator uh, in Burlington or Berlin, other parts of, of the state would be curtailed. <coughs> and will the ones that are already being curtailed be curtailed more? Potentially, yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So that's the impact that we saw. This so. If we simply look at those lines and transformers that are overloaded and we uh, fix those with transmission upgrades, meaning we reconduct our lines, provide additional capacity, then the cost estimate for that work is over $300 million to upgrade all of those lines. Is that, yep. sorry, is that yes. cost, would that be entirely Velcro's cost or is there an ISO contribution? Excellent, excellent question. Uh, because these uh, overloads or, or system concerns are related to generation and not load, meaning customer demand. Uh, transmission upgrades would be a Vermont cost. Uh, mm. uh, ISO New England does not consider generation constraints as a reliability concern that needs to be mitigated. Uh, the reason is generation is a uh, is competitive sector, right? Um, they're allowed to compete for transmission capacity. Uh, so the more competition, the lower the price. So customers, in theory, um, benefit from competition. Uh, but if you're the owner of the generator, it's not such a good thing. Uh, and it's complicated in Vermont because 
Vermont utilities are vertically integrated, whereas elsewhere in New England, they're either transmission only or transmission and distribution. They do not own generation. So we have a different paradigm here in Vermont, whereas um, generation constraints are actually could be a bad thing for customers in Vermont as well. Thank you. What I have here the, on the slide is, is um, our projection of what a doubling of Q2 would mean for the, the load shape in Vermont. And plotting again the, uh, the load in the middle of the day in April and May. Um, and when we double Q2, uh, we will see negative loads in Vermont as a state. Um, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, this has not happened before. Um, so. Perhaps there will be a structural change in the markets with ISO to make this work. Um, I'm also providing on this slide the uh, calculation that I did to reach the amount that we think we'll, we will need. It's over, <coughs> over a thousand megawatts of generation. Uh, we double Q2. It uh, depends on the technology that we use, whether it's solar or wind. It uh, depends on the capacity factor of the resource. I'm assuming about 15% capacity factor for solar. And you follow, if you follow all the calculation here, um, we believe that the amount of generation needed would be over 1,000 megawatt. Um, it could be 1,200, but in general, you're talking about 1,000 megawatt of generation um, to support the T2 requirements. Is there a, currently, is there a cost-effective way to capture that uh, sort of belly in the graph? And, carry that power over to pull the peak down right or left of it, especially to the right of it? There is a, uh, several ways to, to do this. Uh, maybe, uh, immediately we think about storage as the solution. And you can store that energy in the middle of the day and move that over to nighttime. Uh, as you look at this slide, for instance, uh, the amount of energy would be very, uh, very large. Right, um, and uh, so again, an hour of storage or two hours of storage is not sufficient. We really need five, six hours of storage to do that. Yes, Senator John. So storing it in the middle of the day and moving it to the nighttime. Do you mean moving it to the evening peak, or do you mean nighttime after dark, uh, uh, from eight o'clock, nine o'clock, ten o'clock? So it's a uh, okay. Dark, e e evening, e evening, e evening. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and then there, then there are, there are you know, storage is certainly uh, uh, a way of doing it. You can also move load, move consumption to the middle of the day. Uh, in other words, you can, you can sort of eat, eat your house earlier than you would. Uh, you know, you can think about that. Right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, and this way here is, is um, showing the amount of uh, generation that um, Vermont can accommodate. Um, it's showing that uh, different areas of Vermont have different capacities. Uh, in the southern portion of the state, we can, we can integrate more, more generation in the northern portion of the state. Uh, for instance, in the southern area, uh, the amount is on the order of 225 megawatts. But as you go north, uh, towards uh, Newport or Highgate, you're, you're in you have 10, 15 megawatts. Um, so if you want to uh, minimize the amount of transmission upgrades that you need, you need to encourage generation development further south. Uh, that's where the capacity exists. So that's, uh, this is showing our ability to accommodate generation in the line. And those numbers are, are based on some assumptions that I would say are, are optimistic, but some, some of them are actually unrealistic. And I'm going to pick a few on the next slide just to show you what that means. Um, in our analysis, we uh, decided to keep our tie closed at zero. You know, earlier in one slide, we're importing from Canada or importing from Europe. We said, let's keep those at zero to make room for distributed generation in Vermont. So every megawatt that we import from New York on a premium train line is one megawatt less that we, we can install in Vermont. 
Um, the other thing I would point to is when we did this analysis, we assumed that there would not be any um, transmission-connected generation, uh, those generators that are FERC jurisdictional, um, that would be dispatched, like the next 20 megawatt solar project in Coolidge. Um, we said none of those will connect, uh, which is not very realistic. Uh, at least the, there'll be one more that will connect in Vermont. And any megawatt from those resources that connect in Vermont, it's one megawatt less that can be installed on a distribution level. Uh, we also made the assumptions around the distribution system capacity. Um, that anything that can be done there will be done. Uh, the system will be upgraded to accommodate additional. <coughs> and we know that certain areas in Vermont where, where uh, system upgrades will not be either uh, cost effective or, or, uh, or the preferred way of, of resolving concern. So the 1,000 megawatt of capacity for the state uh, based on transmission capacity is an optimistic number. Uh, we, we think it, it actually, it's actually less than that. Uh, when you take into account the way that the system operated, take into account that we, we import power in Vermont uh, through our ties, and there will be additional uh, sort of larger generators that will connect on the system that will take up, that will you know, uh, absorb some of the capacity um, that will not be used for distribution. And, and to uh, conclude, um, I'll, I'll say again that um, reliability is, is really important to, to Velco. Uh, and um, for us, this means that we work really hard to enable uh, state goals. Uh, we want renewable energy to increase, uh, but in a way that uh, reduces uh, grid impacts. Um, there are ways of doing that. There's, there's certainly load management, uh, the storage. Uh, there may be a need to reinforce the system, uh, but we'll try really hard to minimize that. Uh, and what we're saying here is that location matters. Uh, so pay attention to location. Uh, if there's a way to, to coordinate generation additions in Vermont, we would encourage additional generation in the southern portion of the state where, where there's instead of the northern portion of the state. Um, the next version of the plan, 2000, um, the, the long range plan will be in 2021. We've actually started this analysis with working with our load forecaster, our consultant, ITRON, to help us forecast solar PV, forecast uh, electric vehicles, heat pumps, um, uh, working with the Vermont system planning community to do that. And whatever uh, we end up in terms of the rule, whether it's here, you know, 10 percent or 20 percent, whatever that is, we're going to make sure that the system is uh, is planned, designed reliably, um, and we'll work with Vermont to make sure that happens in a reliable yeah, manner. That's my testimony. Um, any additional questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, thank you for having us this morning. So, again, my name is Josh Castonier. I'm the Vice President Chief Innovation Officer at Green on Power. I'm responsible for our, our power supply, um, the engineering team, and the innovation work that we do. Our background is about electrical engineering. And with me today as well is Hi, uh, and thank you for having us. Uh, I'm Doug Smith, um, Chief uh, Power Supply Executive. So I basically focus on power markets on behalf of our customers, trying to uh, find sources of power at the lowest cost we can and to get the most value out of them. And that's how to keep power costs low. So that's the type of thing I and my team focus on. So a good day for us, just to give a little tangible flavor, is if we make a good choice, like on when to buy electricity for this winter or next winter, we buy it before the market goes up, or we wait when the market goes down, that's a good day. It's like a decrease to our rate. So that's what that's a version of what success feels like to us and the kind of uh, things that we work on. All right, so just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the, um, the res bill that we're discussing today. And, 
hit on three points. Um, one is just in terms of, of the, as Mr. President said before, the success of the policy so far and the amount of solar that's been deployed. Um, you know, tier two and tier one have worked. Also talk about tier two and, and the doubling being supportive of that with, while also seeing the opportunity to expand the types of resources, the sizes, the geographic location, do the types of things that will avoid some of the concerns that Mr. President um, raised as well around, also around cost, also around seasonal capability of renewables, winter time, that sort of thing. And finally, tier one. And I mean, as some folks know, we've committed to 100% by 2030 as well. So we're supportive there. I just want to talk about some of the flexibility that we see that's important on tier one. So just starting with um, how successful the programs have been in Vermont Solar continues to be very strong in GMP's territory. Um, I believe in other DUs as well, but from a both a, a net metering as well as non-net metering, it's just a chart of deployment over the last number of years. And you can see in 2019, um, with both net metering alone uh, in 2019 was actually a little bit higher than 2018, but when you include other projects, uh, non-net metering standard offer, some of the uh, PPA or power purchase type solar projects and the larger ones, um, it's exceeded 2017 and 2018. And these are solar systems that have been installed actually online in the territory. There's a, there's a lot more in the pipeline or in development, permitting, that sort of thing. And I just add, if you, this, the shape of that chart looks a little different from some that you may have seen. Um, 2019 was a pretty big year for us. Um, one reason for that may be that some of the public databases are a little lag. Fourth quarter is usually a big year in Vermont for solar completions, and uh, 2019 was no exception. So um, uh, that may not have shown up on some earlier charts, which I don't think they had the advantage of complete year of uh, data yet. Okay, thank you. So then as we look across the country and where it is Vermont, right, this is, this is a snapshot of basically the amount of distributed solar against our, our peak demand, sort of setting up a ratio there. Um, and again, as you can see, other than Hawaii, we're, GMP's territory, and this really does carry through in Vermont, has been a, has been a leader in deployment, which, is, which has been great. It does the types of things that Mr. President raised about knocking down the peak. I mean, prior to the, to the solar we have, the peak used to be in the middle of the day, and early afternoon, um, is now shifted to, to the evening hours and in the winter time from the statewide peak. And just in terms of distributed generation growth, um, when we think about DG in the distributed generation, that's the smaller projects that are distributed across the grid. Um, everything from you know, the cow power, which are the, the biodigesters on farms, um, to solar. And, and as you can see, really what, um, over the last few years, the solar has been the thing that has, has been working well through, through tier two. We'll get into, Mr. Smith will get into a little bit more about how we think of that um, from a power supply portfolio and why um, just relying on one resource can raise concerns from uh, getting to the grid perspectives a little bit, similar to what Mr. President and Belko are talking about. Um, Mr. Smith will talk about the impacts like power supply and portfolio, but just thinking about like anything, ha you know, having all of it in one, one basket at a point um, can raise some issues on the system and it's something we need to think about, especially the, the seasonality. When I think about the importance of renewables knocking out carbon from the system, we got an issue in the winter time as well that we need to really be thinking about. If I could just add, a lot of folks ask, why is that? Why is it overwhelmingly solar so far? It's not like the utilities or our um, public service department or others are against other uh, distributed resources here in Vermont. Not at all. It's just that many of the others, hydro uh, digesters, small wind, they each have factors that are tended to limit their practical ability um, uh, to get built, uh, limited fuel, limited number of suitable sites. It's not that they're not wanted. It, there tend to be factors that constrain how fast they can grow up. That's all. So um, you just saw the chart on the, or the, uh, the map on the right, as Mr. President pointed out. And, and Velik is looking at it from the transmission level, and we have to look at it from the, sort of the next layer down, the distribution level, um, which are the poles and wires that feed the homes and, and businesses. And um, so in addition to the 
expanding congestion that can occur at the transmission level. We also have underlying distribution, sub, what we call sub-transmission or the, the, the middle level of transmission um, constraints. This is the, on the left is a snapshot of, of GMP's solar map that we published. So um, when it comes to siting, we hope this gets used by developers and folks that are looking for sites that may be a little more conducive to siting or less costly. But um, you know the red and the orange uh, and the yellow sort of represent um, cir circuits on our system where the solar is actually starting to bump up against the limit of the entire substation, which is a pretty big limit. That means that you've got enough solar to essentially go in the reverse direction and hit the limit of a substation. Uh, and so that's that's just what this shows. We're thinking through like, okay, how as if it were a sort of a solar only approach in the future, how much more cost could be showing up there um, and driving up the cost? So that, that's a big piece of why we think about the, the system and the impacts here. So Velco's work was very helpful in that regard, looking, I have to compliment them for looking ahead at the what ifs that uh, Mr. Presume worked through. Um, that's really helpful context for, for uh, planners and, and others in the state to, to figure out how to get more renewables in. Very helpful. So, Mr. Chair, before we move on, I mean, that's one of the things I've been talking about for several years now is we as a state, I'm from the Shiai area, and so I know all the issues up there, yet developers are still proposing projects up there. It makes my head explode. And I think we as a state owe it to uh, the electric ratepayers to do something about where we're allowing developers to put more developments because it certainly doesn't make sense to put them where you guys are pushing up against your limits or in the Shi'ai area. The whole idea of distributed energy was to get it close to the end user where, where it needed to be so we didn't have to build new poles and wires. That's, that's true. And as we, you know, and as we've been thinking about it, in terms of the actual doubling of tier two, we've been um, the size and location, you know, for the potential. So keeping the existing tier two the same, continuing to grow that as in-state distributed. But the second piece of tier two having more flexibility that matches actually what other states are doing, where it could even be outside of Vermont, but it's still driving new incremental renewable generation, um, giving us a, a large, you know, a larger swath of opportunity for for generation, including sources that are better in the winter time. <coughs> it's a sound observation and uh, that you made. Um, I would just support Velko's point that there, um, there are things that we can do in terms of encouraging um, in-state generation in different locations that will tend to not aggravate or bring on uh, costly uh, grid uh, impacts. That, that'll uh, require some work, some changes in uh, incentives and guidance to where projects are located, but um, uh, that may well be worth it. Um, as informed by that Velcro work. And the other, only other thing I'd add is um, there are options. Mr. Prez may talk about storage. There are other ways. Um, uh, some states have reduced or curtailed, he called it, the output of renewables. If the need for new transmission is driven by only a very few hours, it may be cheaper to actually sacrifice a little bit of renewable generation rather than paying a quite costly upgrade. So it's it's all just about being thoughtful. Or something else. Yes, sir. Yeah, That's one, one, of the, one of the things we're working on is, if we're, you know, the, the hope is we continue to see electric vehicles take hold and, and grow. And if you can do things like charge them in the middle of the day, it creates a load in the day and actually helps us. It's another form of storage, essentially. Um, but we're thinking a lot of other different opportunities there as well. We get an abundance of solar midday, so take advantage of it. Does, uh, does your map uh, guide the rate at which uh, projects are, uh, well, costs, let me think, for energy generated on a solar array, mm -hmm. is that rate reflective of the location? So for instance, are there, if you're proposing a project in a red zone, mm -hmm. um, regardless of the precise location you choose, can you not get a preferred <coughs> preferred location rate? Current, as I understand it, currently the preferred location piece of it, it does not actually refer to distribution constraints. It's a bit more about brown, uh, brown fields, not, you know, that, that type of geographic. So as I understand it today, no, that's not the case. This does, however, the intention is um, 
it should give a developer an indication that if I'm in a red zone compared to a green, I could expect a higher interconnection cost. Okay. So it flows through an interconnect rather than rate. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. I mean, I think the goal and the conversation we've been having for years is that the real world costs <coughs> and constraints should um, be brought into the math of deciding what gets built where and what how much uh, so, it's paid. So far, so far in, in my view, it hasn't worked. And that's why I think we as legislators need to give weight to the, <coughs> the green areas. They shouldn't just be looking at brownfield in a, in a constricted area of the grid. <coughs> We're still seeing people uh, apply for development in places that we know are completely constrained. So I think the, the market is not going to straighten itself out without some policy change. Yeah, and I think back to um, the flexibility, you know, thinking about flexibility in tier two, one of the under net metering, that's correct. The net metering rates are set, fixed. There are siting adders, subtractors. Outside of net metering in, a, in a, a PPA, that will actually show up because somebody who has a higher interconnection cost is essentially going to have to charge a higher <coughs> PPA price, which may make them a little less competitive than somebody else. So it can show up in projects at a good scale and, and that type of thing. Um, but you're absolutely right. I think there's, it currently isn't tied to. So, um, shall I'll kick it over to Mr. Smith to talk a little bit more about just the impact on, on power supply and kind of day to day management of that? Um, thanks. So, um, uh, as we, the Belco uh, uh, witness was discussing, um, solar's big source for us. On a sunny day, it's actually our biggest uh, single power source now, like bigger than any other power purchase agreement, for example. But that is when it's sunny. Um, just the part of this chart here is to contrast the difference. This is two consecutive days um, of last August. The first one has a, a yellow is solar production from the fleet of resources that uh, Josh showed earlier. It's net metering as well as power purchase agreements, the state standard offer program. It's basically the sum of all that. And the maximum production is in the low 200 megawatts on that particular uh, 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 early afternoon. Um, and uh, so what the implication here is when we design a power portfolio, power markets are quite volatile. So part of what our team's job uh, is, if we can uh, arrange a set of power resources that matches when Vermont needs the power approximately, it insulates us from what the ISO New England market is doing, shortages in natural gas or surpluses, whatever. It insulates our cost from that. Turning to, to the, um, the choice we have here, um, if the 1,000 megawatts or a bit more statewide that Mr. Presme was talking about, we think that number is a, is a reasonable estimate. If, if that unfolds uh, in Vermont, we will be looking on the sunny days at having hundreds of megawatts of power more than we need during the sunniest hours. And that's not um, a catastrophic thing, but it means we will be selling that into the spot market often at a loss. <clears throat> Another example, the following day, the 21st of August, that was a cloudy day. We only got, I don't know, something like a quarter or a fifth as much. That's two consecutive days. This illustrates how on a cloudy day and in the evening peaks um, that uh, Senator McDonald asked about earlier, we, uh, Vermont would be a big buyer in the power market. This is if, if we are overly reliant on one, um, one source. Um, uh, the solar, um, and um, that's really just the point we want to make here, that relying on solar to the exclusion of other sources can have some costs and also some challenges in managing the power and the cost for our customer. Um, a diversity in renewables, either through technology or location, uh, can help with that. The contrast um, is the blue line here. This is the Hydro-Quebec, the long-term power purchase agreement from Quebec. GMP is a major purchaser along with other Vermont utilities. My point here is just to indicate that from a, a, um, a source like that that's supplied from a fleet of resources, it can be basically scheduled in a firm way, and it's a healthy complement against the, uh, a lot of our renewables, wind, hydroelectric, uh, solar, the group they have, 
intermittence can be put to different degrees. So from a practitioner perspective, it's helpful to have some amount of our power from a firmer or more uh, steady resource. Um, so we each touched a bit on this theme of flexibility. Uh, this slide will try to tie it together. So we've talked about how um, presently res tier two is largely a distributed solar uh, requirement. Um, I've given an estimated range here. Um, as you know, the bill features gradual increases in the tier two requirement. I took the last year, 2032, to give you a sense of magnitudes, and we set a range of 15 to $25 million uh, a year of uh, extra cost to Vermont customers if tier two, as it's just presently defined, were doubled. I set a range because it depends on a number of uncertainties. Future solar technology, the policies here, the grid cost that uh, Velco talked about, but um, I'll just give you briefly on what the range represents. Currently, net metering, as you saw from the chart earlier, is dominant solar source here in Vermont. Um, it's larger than the sum of the others. That's a pretty high-priced form of solar. If the increase from 10% up to 20 is met substantially with that, um, that will produce higher costs than I've shown here. This range assumes that only a modest amount from none to like 10 or 15% of the increase comes from net metering. If it were like half or, or all uh, net metering, it, it'd be higher than that range. Um, the so range- you far exceed your 25, you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Um, the, uh, uh, the low end of the range here assumes that nearly all of the increase in tier two is met with in-state solar, uh, but in a, the most competitive way we can, like power purchase agreements. Think of a competitive procurement, uh, and those projects would be sized from a megawatt to five megawatts. Um, and uh, it assumes that um, there's not, there's only a little bit of the increased grid cost that Mr. President talked about. The higher end of the range assumes that um, a bit more of the supply is met from net metering, which has a higher price per kilowatt hour, and it introduces uh, uh, about a cent per kilowatt hour, I, I, probably a little light on that, but of grid costs that are reflective of the type that Velco talked about. Um, it's, um, so this is an indicative range to give you just a sense of magnitude, and the rest of the slide basically amounts to uh, we hope for the opportunity to do better in terms of flexibility. We think we can get a lower cost and a better fit <clears throat> with the power needs if we can um, uh, choose um, from different sizes of projects, different technologies, uh, including some out of state, um, similar to what the prominent renewable requirements in the region, other state renewable portfolio standards feature. That gives a good deal of flexibility. We hope to beat those numbers. And I think the odds of looking back and ending up on the high end of the cost are lower if we have a greater flexibility. I guess that's our thematic message of, what we, of how we would hope to um, have flexibility to procure these increasing requirements. So, you know, essentially as we look at, we've looked at tier two as the, as the new the new renewable tier. It's been a new distributed generation tier. Um, you know, as Mr. Smith mentioned, uh, building flexibility into an, any expansion there would be important. And in, in the meanwhile, in the meantime, we have <coughs> tier one the existing. So the rest of our portfolio doing everything we can to make that renewable with existing resources. Um, again, as I said, we we've we've committed to moving to 100 percent by 2030. So obviously, fully supportive there. The the concern we have with limiting any one resource. Um, isn't so much about about doing more with any one resource. It's just about the message it sends to the to the region that has those other sources. And if you take one of the other players off the table, it can disadvantage uh, Vermont from a cost perspective. So uh, that's really on the tier one side. I mean, you know, our goal is you need to move very quickly there um, and keep that get that to 100% um, and stay there while we continue to grow the new incremental renewables, which need to happen now continue to have an impact, but just back to the flexibility, not sending a signal 
to other suppliers that there's one major player that's not there anymore. Just to put a point on it, in this region, the supply of, um, of hydroelectric, it, it is finite. And the other states, uh, particularly Massachusetts and Connecticut, are getting uh, more heavily involved in um, goals I don't like our, our tier one. They call it clean energy uh, in some cases. But the point being, they're focused more and more on limiting the, on making their portfolio more renewable and limiting the, uh, uh, the emissions as well and getting more. So they, there's more competition um, for the smaller hydro than there used to be. Um, so one quick question is that, in general, I always think of the, the design goals for your system is to maximize reliability <coughs> at lowest cost while limiting environmental impacts. And so if you go to 100% renewable by 2030, what does that do to, does that add pressure on the cost side, or can you speak to that point? Well, I mean, so it's a good question. It, ultimately, it obviously depends on <coughs> if we have any, any restrictions on how to get there, any requirements. But um, no, from the 100% standpoint, um, being able to, to source it from, from existing, does it, it's minimal in the cost pressure. Um, from a, a grid standpoint, it, it's, again, it's existing. So there isn't really any additional concerns on a, on a grid constraints or cost, and then obviously in the carbon standpoint, we'll, it'll, be, it'll be renewable. So from that perspective, continuing to have the flexibility that we, we have today under tier one, it would be, it'd be minimal in the cost. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thanks for coming in. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Craig Keeney. I'm the manager of power planning at Vermont Electric Co-op. With me today is Andrea Cohen and Lisa Morris, also from BBC. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to come here and talk to, talk to you about our perspective on the proposed uh, S267. Uh, just give you a little background on BBC. For what it's worth, we are all familiar with BBC. It's okay, so it's time to I mean, just given how much time we have, I think it's the chair. Okay. Just okay. going is not just yeah. pretty up to the data yeah. on, on BEC operations and nature and customer base. Okay, fine. So we support the concept that we need to reduce uh, carbon <clears throat> emissions both in Vermont and worldwide. But we uh, want to do that in the most cost effective way possible and at appropriate levels. In fact, our board of directors currently is discussing whether they would want the, the co op to exceed the current red requirements, and if so, by how much and what cost. So, why is cost such an important issue? Because of the 10 towns. In Vermont, with the highest poverty level, BBC serves eight. Of the five counties with the highest poverty level, we serve three. So we have a lot of customers who are struggling to meet their monthly bills and, and, and make ends meet on a monthly basis. <coughs> uh, so that's the perspective that we're coming from. I'd like to talk to you, walk you through quickly uh, what our current power supply mix is. Not showing up very small, uh, large in the screen, but in 2009, the top uh, pie chart shows in 2019 of all the energy purchases that we made on behalf of our members, what the fuel source is. About 70% of that was renewable, about 85% of carbon free, if you include the nuclear contract. So that's the sources of the power. Our goal is to meet the red requirement, the least cost, or the least cost way possible. So trade recs, sell excess recs, and our and we meet the recs to the 55% requirement. Even though we have more recs to do, we could retain more recs and do that. But by selling the recs, we reduce our cost by 1.8 million dollars last year. 128. 1.8. One point. So chart two showed where we ended up with that power supply after trading all the racks. And we were 55% renewable and 2.2% of that was the distributed energy. So next uh, chart on chart three. 
this shows where we are right now with our committed resources compared to the proposed, uh, the current tier two requirement and the proposed tier two requirement. So let me just walk you through that because a lot of information. From uh, the X axis has each year going out through 2032. The columns are stat the stack columns are are committed resources <coughs> from tier two requirements. And each of those are PPAs that we have with developers, except for the top blue, which is net metering. And that net metering, obviously, that net metering hasn't been built yet. But that's our projection that we used in the uh, 2019 uh, greater resource plan. The solid black line is our projected tier two requirement under the current risk. The dash is under the proposed risk. So what, this, what does this tell you? Under the proposed risk, assuming that meter comes on as we think it will, we have enough resources right now to meet the proposed res to 2030. So what's that mean? What, how will that, what's going to be the impact then compared to you know, going from the current res to the proposed res? It's primarily going to be we're going to retain more recs and not be able to sell as much and a lot of cost. So just to make sure I understand, for the net metering uh, component um, that it stacks well above the solid black line, yes. that creates an opportunity for you to do some rec sales, for instance, like you're saying, that you were able to bring in 1.8 million yes. that then you could apply to lowering your energy costs for your customers. That, am I understanding that right? And then as a result of the net metering? As a result of rec sales, you're yes. able to generate income that reduces your net cost of power to your current customers. That's correct. Okay. And then if we go to the dotted line, yes. you're short of um, you're short of what you would need to have. So you'd have to be acquired. You no longer have a rec sales opportunity. You're going to have to be purchasing. Is that going to happen? Is that oh, well, what, is that what the going above the your total supply? Indicates. I'm not entirely sure how to read the dotted line. Yes. Okay. Okay. So let me walk, let me walk through that dotted line. So this dotted line shows that let's look at only the well, let's take the blue out. That's net metering. Okay. This dotted line shows that even without net metering, we currently have enough resources to meet the proposed tier two requirement until 2025. Okay. And then beyond that. We would need something. In 2026, we would be short without an meter because there's a little, the, the dashed line goes into the blue. Okay? So net metering would be helping us then. But, so the, the confusing thing to me about net metering is you may be able to get the recs, but net metering is still extremely high cost power. So how does that affect the price to the rate payers? Well, good question. And that's the table. Okay, I don't want to get ahead well, of Well, if we're short on time, maybe we should go there. So, turn to the table. There are two tables. The table on the left shows the cost of the BDC if we met our shortfall in tier two at nine cents a kilowatt hour, which is if we were to enter a PPA with any developer that's not the only one, and you see in 2032, the, in, the total increase in our cost is 2.3 million. Mm -hmm. The chart on the right shows if we were to meet our shortfall at 14 cents a kilowatt hour, which is actually a little bit below the current net metering rates. That's 4.39 million. So an extra two million to rate pairs. Yes, but you heard Mr. Smith say that just a few minutes ago that his range was 15 million to 25 million. Mm -hmm. 
or GMP, we have one eighth their size. You multiply by eight, you get just about his range. Yeah. 16 million to 30. And this doesn't take into account the constraints in your service area, does it? That's correct. But the two bullets below that indicate, uh, yeah, I explained that this does not take into account any of the infrastructure costs that mm -hmm. or below in the sub transmission system that Mr. Cassidy is talking about. We will eventually have those costs too, and it does not have those. Mm -hmm. So likely if we added this much net metering to that system, it seems to me like we would be forcing more curtailment of the larger producers. That is correct, without a bigger transmission system, yes. Right. And, and bear it down. Just to, and, and what I think I learned today, or was more clear, was when it comes to um, upgrading our transmission system for distribution <coughs> to ISO share. I think it was your testimony. <coughs> when it comes to upgrading our system to get generation out, it's solely on us. That's correct. Correct. And um, I know that's sinking in in a way that, for some of us, wasn't as clear as it has been. Yes. So, I, so when you're curtailed, um, you either, as Senator Rogers says, uh, deal with the uh, oversupply, possible oversupply and net metering, and, um, or you find a way to um, market some of your electricity. Yes, and to do that, we have to upgrade the system. I'm or put old-fashioned light bulbs in in the kingdom so we can burn some I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I will ask a question about electric vehicles when it's appropriate. We only have 10 minutes, so I'll ask it now. Okay. Um, 10 minutes total. It, Washington Electric is, is, is the most similar to your co-op. Yes. Washington Electric's not curtailed. Washington Electric has slightly fewer houses per whatever. Um, yet, Vel uh, um, Vermont Electric Co-op has the lowest subsidy, cash subsidy for electric vehicles, which, um, and it is the most constrained area in the state. And yep. were you to go in and say, we need a rate increase because we're getting squeezed, why wouldn't the PUC say, we're not giving you a rate increase until you start subsidizing electric vehicles in a way that be, so you can begin to sell some of your constrained power. Um, why are you so reluctant to invest the money to sell your constrained power and to sell the power between midnight and four o'clock in the morning that if sold would reduce the electric costs of all your ratepayers? Why are you stuck on not being able to deal with that today? Um, I'm just going to say it's not a fair question for Craig because he's our power supply guy and we want to make sure he gets through the tier one. And I'm very happy to come back and talk well, about uh, our tier three strategy. Right. Perfect. Thank you. It's, it's a valid question. I will point yes. out though that these, this chart here that shows our tier two requirement, it includes our projection of electric vehicle mm -hmm. adoption, which I've been told is faster than any other utility is assuming right now. Oh. Would be a heck of a lot faster if it. Okay. Well, and then I would like to make one more point before we move on. As I understand it, also the constrained power <coughs> is you can get the the big wind or the hydro Quebec or whatever else is being constrained up there. A lot of that is less costly power than the new net metering that is shown in your graph coming on would be. Yes. I think Quebec is considerably cheaper than most of that. So um, to our last two witnesses, I would say, um, can we reschedule rather than ask you to rush go through. triple time through something that we want to slow down enough to make sure we can make it? understand the what we're working our way through because there's some complexity and nuance they there. just love hanging out here so. <laughs> thank you um, so, I will come back. <laughs> we've, 
I mean, <laughs> jumped around a little in your presentation. And yeah. um, so knowing that we have about five more minutes, are you know, there are things in here that you want to draw our attention to before we adjourn for today? Sure, two things. One thing we skipped, uh, we turn the page from, from where we are. Just the, the top chart there shows different It's a table from the Department of Public Services uh, 2020 annual energy report, and it shows cost comparison of different carbon reduction strategies. With the most cost effective being our top least cost effective. <coughs> so when you have time to look at that, walk through that. And uh, we think that's important because the uh, you know cost is a big concern to us. Uh, the other thing I'd point out that the only, the only two tier or tier two options on there are the ones highlighted in yellow. Everything else would be a tier three option fossil fuel conversion. <coughs> on the bottom part of that page is a little discussion about our community solar project that we have that is similar to net metering, except that VEC developed it. We were able to bring it online considerably cheaper than net metering. But members who aren't able to put it on the net metering on the roof have been able to take advantage of it. Uh, can you explain just a little bit about how, I mean, this could have been a facility, you build your own generation and you're simply the off-taker from your own facility. But what's the relationship between um, buying, sort of creating this and supplying your, um, your system and then customers buying into it? I'm trying to understand what, compare, can you contrast that with traditional net metering? So we could have put it in our own resource mix, given it to every member. We open it up for members who specifically wanted to support renewable power, okay. which is similar to that meter, except that it is much cheaper than that. Okay. Did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just uh, uh, because it's market-based. We went out to bid. We got competitive rates. We uh -huh. were able to negotiate that and leverage that, you know, like a, you know, purchasing on behalf of our members, we're able to negotiate a better rate. So you're not the owners of the, the facility, or you are? We are not. not we clear. have a, uh, ownership, we have a, a PPA, basically. Yep. Senator Rogers. And one more thing before I go on, I, I think I've pointed this out to the committee before, because I've tried to get um, the net metering down to the 150 kW, but I see in your chart the net metering up to the 5 kW is much more costly per savings on carbon. Is that, am I reading that correctly? Yes, unfortunately, this is a chart from the Department of Public Service, so I'm not exactly sure how they came up with their values, mm -hmm. but um, it is just conceptually, it's less expensive per unit to build a 150 kW project than it is to build a 5 kW project. It's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Senator McDowell. I, I want to apologize to, to Andrew Cohen. Oh. Um, she, we've been talking about electric vehicles since and she has told us that if the Bell um, Fund Electric Co ops has been working on maybe adjusting that, that subsidy, and I didn't. I want to recognize that there's that's being worked on. It. Yes. My apology. Thank you. Uh, all right. So um, we are being called to the floor. That oh, okay. notice. And um, if unless there's one more thing you want to say before we wrap up. Yeah. Just read the conclusion at the end. Okay. I'm really tired and you just have nothing else to do. Read those. And you know, just summarize what I just said. There's nothing in there. And I guess the only one point we do not, yep. we do not support a provision that would limit our ability to, or limit any resources we could serve the rest of the okay. okay. um, Just it limits our negotiating ability. All it can do is increase. The tier one, uh, if the 100% by 2030 component, okay. is that a, are you, Fine with that cost? Can you manage that, or is that a stressor to your system? Well, things of what, what I'm hearing, I think manage. tier two is more of a cost <coughs> than a tier one discussion. Yes. So, if you turn to this, these tables, yep. 
the tier one cost impact is the leftmost column in each of those tables. So it is the smaller impact. Okay, great. We don't have a position on it right now, but that's an indication of how much it would cost. So thank you again, and to the witnesses, we did get to appreciate your flexibility, and we'll schedule time next week. With that, we are adjourned. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.